Good evening, and thank you for joining me for another Boring Books for Bedtime. I hope tonight's selection provides all the boredom your busy brain needs to quiet down and let you get some sleep. So find a comfortable spot, adjust your volume, take a nice deep breath in, let it out slowly, and off we go. Before we begin, I'd like to give a special shout out of thanks to three new members of our Patreon, Rita, Andy, and Claire. Thank you all so much for your support. It helps us keep this podcast going week after week and keeps it ad-free for everyone. All three of you, along with everyone else who supports us via Patreon or buymeacoffee.com this month, will be entered into a raffle to win an exclusive episode all your own. And because it's all your own, copyright restrictions do not apply. So if you ever wanted to fall asleep to a modern book, this is your chance. You'll find links to Patreon and buymeacoffee.com in the show description, and I hope you take a moment to check them out. Now, let's get to the reading. Tonight, we're relaxing with Mars and Its Canals by Percival Lowell, director of the observatory at Flagstaff, Arizona, non-resident professor of astronomy at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, member of the Astronomical and Astrophysical Society of America, Janssen Medalist of the Société Astronomique de France, 1904, for researches on Mars, etc., etc. Copyright 1906 by the Macmillan Company, New York and London. Let's begin. To G. V. Scaparelli, The Columbus of a New Planetary World, this investigation upon it is appreciatively inscribed. Preface Eleven years have elapsed since the writer's first work on Mars was published, in which were recorded the facts gleaned in his research up to that time and in which was set forth a theory of their explanation. Continued work in the interval has confirmed the conclusions there stated, sometimes in quite unexpected ways. Five times during that period, Mars has approached the Earth within suitable scanning distance and been subjected to careful and prolonged scrutiny. Familiarity with the subject, improved telescopic means, and long-continued training have all combined to increase efficiency in the procuring of data and to results which have been proportionate. A mass of new material has thus been collected, some of it along old lines, some of it in lines that are themselves new, and both have led to the same outcome. In addition to thus pushing inquiry into advanced proportions of the subject, study has been spent in investigation of the reality of the phenomena upon which so much is based, and in testing every theory which has been suggested to account for them. From diplopia to optical interference, each of these has been examined and found incompatible with the observations. The phenomena are all they have been stated to be, and more. Each step forward in observation has confirmed the genuineness of those that went before. To set forth science in a popular, that is, in a generally understandable form, is as obligatory as to present it in a more technical manner. If men are to benefit by it, it must be expressed to their comprehension. To do this should be feasible for him who is master of his subject, and is both the best test of 
and the best training to that post. Especially vital is it that the exposition should be done at first hand, for to describe what a man has himself discovered comes as near as possible to making a reader the co-discoverer of it. Not only are thus escaped the mistaken glosses of second-hand knowledge, but an aroma of actuality, which cannot be filtered through another mind without sensible evaporation, clings to the account of the pioneer. Nor is it so hard to make any well-grasped matter comprehensible to a man of good general intelligence, as is commonly supposed. The whole object of science is to synthesize, and so, simplify, and did we but know the uttermost of a subject, we could make it singularly clear. Meanwhile, technical phraseology, useful as shorthand to the cult, becomes meaningless jargon to the uninitiate, and is paraded most by the least profound. But worse still for their employ, symbols tend to fictitious understanding. Formulae are the anesthetics of thought, not its stimulants. And to make anyone think is far better worthwhile than cramming him with ill-considered and therefore indigestible learning. Even to the technical student, a popular book, if well done, may yield most valuable results, for nothing in any branch of science is so little known as its articulation, how the skeleton of it is put together, and what may be the mode of attachment of its muscles. Mars and its Canals Part 1 Natural Features Chapter 1 On Exploration From time immemorial, travel and discovery have called with strange insistence to him who, wandering on the world, felt adventure in his veins. Then leaving familiar sights and faces, to push forth into the unknown has with magnetic force drawn the bold to great endeavor and fired the thought of those who stayed at home. Spur to enterprise since man first was, this spirit has urged him over the habitable globe. Linked in part to mere matter of support, it led the more daring of the people to quit the shade of their beech trees reposeful as that umbrage may have been, and wander into Central Asia, so to perplex philologists into believing them to have originated there. It lured Columbus across the waste of waters, and caused his son to have carved upon his tomb that ringing couplet of which the simple grandeur still stirs the blood. To Castile and Leon beyond the wave, another world Columbus gave. It drove the early voyagers into the heart of the fast wilderness, there to endure all hardship, so that they might come where their kind had never stood before. And now it points man to the pole. Something of the self-same spirit finds a farther field today, outside the confines of our traversable earth. Science, which has caused the world to shrink and dwindle, has been no less busy bringing near what in the past seemed inaccessibly remote. Beyond our earth, man's penetration has found it possible to pierce and in its widening circle of research, has latterly been made aware of another world of strange enticement across the depths of space. Planetary distances, not mundane ones, are here concerned, and the globe to be explored, though akin to, 
is yet very different from our own. This other world is the planet Mars. Sundered from us by the ocean of ether, a fellow member of our own community of matter there makes its circuit of the sun, upon whose face features show which stamp it as cognate to that on which we live. In spite of the millions of miles of intervening matterless void, upon it markings can be made out that distantly resemble our Earth's topography and grow increasingly suggestive as vision shapes them better. And yet, among the seemingly familiar, reveal aspects which are completely strange. But more than this, over the face of it sweep changes that show it to be not a dead, but a living world, and luring curiosity by details unknown here to further exploration of its unfamiliar ground. To observe Mars is to embark upon this enterprise, not in body but in mind. Though parted by a gulf more impassable than any sea, the telescope lets us traverse what otherwise had been barred and lands us at last above the shores we went forth to seek. Real the journey is, though incorporeal in kind. Since the seeing strange sights is the essence of all far wanderings, it is as truly travel, so the eye arrive as if the body kept it company. Indeed, sight is our only far viatic sense. Touch and taste both hang on contact. Smell stands indebted to the near, and even hearing waits on ponderable matter where sound soon dissipates away. Only sight soars untrammeled of the grosser adjunct of the flesh to penetrate what were otherwise unfathomable space. What the voyager thus finds himself envisaging shares by that very fact in the expansion of the sense that brought him there. No longer tied by means of transport to seas his sails may compass or lands his feet may tread, the traveler reaches a goal removed in kind from his own habitat. He proves to have adventured not into unknown parts of a known world, but into one new to him in its entirety. In extent alone, he surveys what dwarfs the explorer's conquests on Earth. But size is the least of the surprises there in store for him. What confronts his gaze finds commonly no counterpart on Earth. His previous knowledge stands him in scant stead, for he faces what is so removed from everyday experience that analogy no longer offers itself with safety as a guide. He must build up new conceptions from fresh data and slowly proceed to deduce the meaning they may contain. Science alone can help him to interpretation of what he finds. And above all, must he wean himself from human prejudice and earthbound limitation, for he deals here with ultra-mundane things, with just enough of cosmogony in common to make decipherment not despairable. This world is yet so different from the one he personally knows as to wet curiosity at every turn. He is permitted to perceive what piques inquiry, and by patient adding of point to point, promises at last a rational result. Like mundane exploration, it is arduous too. 
Ad astra per aspera is here literally true, for it is a journey not devoid of hardship and discomfort by the way. Its starting point preludes as much. To get conditions proper for his work, the explorer must forego the haunts of men, and even those terrestrial spots found by them most habitable. Astronomy now demands bodily abstraction of its devotee. Its deities are gods that veil themselves amid man-crowded marts, and impose withdrawal and seclusion for the prosecution of their cult, as much as any worshipped for other reason in more primeval times. To see into the beyond requires purity, in the medium now as formerly in the man. As little air as may be, and that only of the best, is obligatory to his enterprise, and the securing it makes him perforce a hermit from his kind. He must abandon cities and forego plains. Only in places raised above and aloof from men can he profitably pursue his search, places where nature never meant him to dwell, and admonishes him of the fact by sundry hints of a more or less distressing character. To stand a mile and a half nearer the stars is not to stand immune. Thus it comes about that today besides its temples erected in cities, monasteries in the wilds are being dedicated to astronomy as in the past to faith. Monasteries made to commune with its spirit, as temples are to communicate the letter of its law. Pioneers in such profession, those already in existence, are but the precursors of many yet to come, as science shall more and more recognize their need. Advance in knowledge demands what they alone can give. Primitive, too, they must be as befits the still, austere sincerity of a cult, in which the simplest structures are found to be the best. Still, the very wildness of the life their devotee is forced to lead has in it a certain fittingness for his post in its primeval detachment from the two earthbound, in concept as in circumstance. Withdrawn from contact with his kind, he is by that much raised above human prejudice and limitation. To sally forth into the untrod wilderness in the cold and dark of a winter's small hours of the morning, with the snow feet deep upon the ground and the frosty stars for mute companionship, is almost to forget oneself a man for the solemn awe of one's surroundings. Fitting portal to communion with another world, it is through such avenue one enters on his quest where the common and familiar no longer jostle the unknown and the strange nor is the stillness of the stars invaded when some long, unearthly howl, like the wail of a lost soul, breaks the slumber of the mesa forest, marking the prowling presence of a stray coyote. Gone as it came, it dies in the distance on the air that gave it birth, and the gloom of the pines swallows up one's vain peering after something palpable, their tops alone decipherable in dark silhouette against the sky. From amid surroundings that for their height and their intenancy fringe the absolute silence of space, the observer must set forth who purposes to cross it to another planetary world. 
But the isolation of his journey is not always so forbidding. His coming back is no less girt with grandeur of a different, though equally detached kind. Even before the stars begin to dim in warning to him to return, a faint suffusion, as of a half-suspected light, creeps into the border of the eastern sky. Against it, along the far, pine-clad horizon, mesa after mesa in shaggy lines of sentineling earth stands forth dark marshaled in the gloom, informed with prescience of what is soon to come. Imperceptibly, the pallor grows, blanching the face of night, and one by one, extinguishing the stars. Slowly then, it takes on color, tinging ever so faintly to a flush that swells and deepens as the minutes pass. One had said the sky lay dreaming up the sun in pale imagery at first that gathers force and feeling till the dreamer thus turns rosy red in slumbering supposition of reality. Then the blush dies out. The crimson fades to pink, the pink to ashes. The stars have disappeared, and yet it is not day. It is the supreme moment of the dawn, the hush with which the earth awaits its full awakening. For now again, the color gathers in the east, not with the impalpable suffusion it had before, but nearer and more vivid, no longer reflectively remote. Rays imminent of the sun strike the upper air, the most adventurously refrangible turning the underside of a few stray clouds into flame-hued bars of glowing metal. They burn thus in the silent east, first red, then orange, and then gold, each spectral tint in prismatic revelation, coming to join the next, till in a sudden blinding burst of splendor, the solar disk tops the horizon's rim. Not less impressive is the journey when the afternoon watch has replaced the morning vigil by the drawing of the planet nearer to the sun. Lost in the brilliance of the dazzling sky, the planet lies hid from the senses' search. The quest were hopeless did not the mind guide the telescope to its goal. To theory alone it is visible still, and so to its predicted place the observer sets his circles, and punctual to the prophecy the planet swings into the field of view. One must be dulled by long routine to such mastery of mind, not to have the act itself clothed with a sense of charmed withdrawal the object of his quest. So much and more there are of travelers' glimpses by the way, compensation that offsets the frequent discomfort, and even balking of his purpose by inopportune cloud. For the best of places is not perfect, and a storm will sometimes rob him of a region he wished to see, he must learn to wait upon his opportunities, and then no less to wait for mankind's acceptance of his results. For in common with most explorers, he will encounter on his return that final penalty of penetration, the certainty at first of being disbelieved. In such respect, he will be even worse off than were the other world discoverers of the 15th and 16th centuries. 
for they at least could offer material proof of things that they had seen. Indians and gold spoke more convincingly than the lips of the great navigators. To astronomy, too, that other world was due. Without a knowledge of the Earth's shape and size, got from Francisco of Pisa, Columbus had never adventured himself upon the deep. But more than this, an astronomer it was, in the person of Americus Vespucius, who first discovered the New World by recognizing it as such, Columbus never dreaming he had lighted upon a world that was new. Nor does it impair one jot or tittle of his glory that he knew it not. Nothing can deprive him of the imperishable fame of launching forth into the void in hope of a beyond, though he found not what he sought, but something stranger still. So curiously has it been with the trans-Etherean. To Scaparelli, the Republic of Science owes a new and vast domain. His genius first detected those strange new markings on the Martian disk, which have proved the portal to all that has since been seen. And his courage in the face of universal condemnation led to exploration of them. He made their voyage after voyage, much as Columbus did on Earth, with even less of recognition from home. As with Columbus, too, the full import of his great discovery lay hid even to him, and only by discovery since is gradually resulting in recognition of another sentient world. Chapter 2 a departure point. As the character of the travel is distinctive, so the outcome of the voyage is unique. If he choose his departure point aright, the observer will be vouchsafed an experience without parallel on Earth. To select this setting out station is the first step in the journey upon which everything depends for it is essential to visual arrival that a departure point be taken where definition is at its best. Now, so far as our present knowledge goes, the conditions most conducive to good seeing turn out to lie in one or other of the two great desert belts that girdle the globe. Many of us are unaware of the existence of such belts, and yet they are among the most striking features of physical geography. Could we get off our globe and view it from without, we should mark two sash-like bands of country to the poleward side of either tropic, where the surface itself lay patently exposed. Unclothed of verdure themselves, they would stand forth doubly clear by contrast, for elsewhere cloud would hide to a greater or less extent the actual configuration of the Earth's topography to an observer scanning it from space. One of these sash-like belts of desert runs through Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico, the Sahara, Arabia Petraea, and the Desert of Gobi. The other traverses Peru, the South African Veldt, and Western Australia. They are desert because in them rain is rare, and even clouds seldom form. In a twofold way, they conduce to astronomic ends. Absence of rain makes primarily for clear skies and secondarily for steady air. And the one of these conditions is no less vital to sight than the other. 
Water vapor is a great upsetter of atmospheric equilibrium, and commotion in the air the spoiler of definition. Thus, from the cloudlessness of their skies, man finds in them most chance of uninterrupted communion with the stars, while by suitably choosing his spot, he here obtains as well that prime desideratum for planetary work. As near a heavenly equanimity in the air currents over his head, as is practically possible. From the fact that these regions are desert, they are less frequented of man, and the observer is thus perforce isolated by the nature of the case. The regions best adapted to mankind being the least suited to astronomic observations. In addition to what nature has thus done in the matter, Humanity has further differentiated the two classes of sights by processes of its own contriving. Not only is civilized man actively engaged in defacing such part of the Earth's surface as he comes in contact with, he is equally busy blotting out his sky. In the latter uncommendable pursuit, he has, in the last quarter of a century, made surprising progress. With a success only too undesirable, his habitat has gradually become canopied by a welkin of his own fashioning, which has rendered it largely unfit for the more delicate kinds of astronomic work. Smoke from multiplying factories by rising into the air and forming the nucleus about which cloud collects, has joined with electric lighting to help put out the stars. These concomitants of advancing civilization have succeeded above the dreams of the most earth-centered in shutting off sight of the beyond, so that today Few city-bred children have any conception of the glories of the heavens, which made of the Chaldean shepherds astronomers in spite of themselves. The old world and the new are alike afflicted by such obliteration. Long ago, London took the lead with fogs proverbial wholly due to smoke, fine particles of solid matter in suspension, making these points of condensation about which water vapor gathers to form cloud. With the increase of smoke-emitting chimneys over the world, other centers of population have followed suit, till today Europe and eastern North America vie with each other as to which sky shall be the most obliterate. Even when the obscuration is not patent to the layman, it is evident to the meteorologist or astronomer. By a certain dimming of the blue, smoke or dust reveals its presence high up aloft, as telltalely as if the thing itself were visible. Some time since, the writer had occasion to traverse Germany in summer from Göttingen to Cologne, and in so doing was impressed by a cloudiness of the sky he felt sure had not existed when he knew it as a boy, for the change was too startling and extensive to be wholly laid to the score of the brighter remembrances of youth. On reaching Cologne, he mentioned his suspicion to Klein, only to find his own inference corroborated, observations made twenty years ago being impracticable today. Two years later in Milan, Saloria told the same story, the study of Mars having ceased to be possible there for like cause. Factory smoke and electric lights had combined to veil the planet, 
At about the same time, Scaparelli gave up his observations because of failing sight. With a certain poetic fitness, the sky had itself been blotted just at the time the master's eye had dimmed. America is not behind in this race for sky extinction. In the neighborhood of its great cities and spreading into the country round about, the heavens have ceased to be favorable to research. Few astronomers even fully appreciate how much this means. So used does man get to slowly changing conditions. It amounts indeed, between Washington and Arizona, to a whole magnitude in the stars which may be seen. At the Naval Observatory of the former, 64 stars were mapped in a region where with a slightly smaller glass, 172 were charted at Flagstaff. Besides their immediate use as observing stations, these desert belts possess immediate interest of their own account in a branch of the very study their cloudlessness helps to promote. The branch here considered the study of the planet Mars. They help explain what they permit to be visible. For in the physical history of the Earth's development, they are among the latest phenomena and mark the beginning of that stage of world evolution into which Mars is already well advanced. They are symptomatic of the passing of a terraqueous globe into a purely terrestrial one. Desertism, the state into which every planetary body must eventually come, and for which, therefore, it becomes necessary to coin a word, has there made its first appearance upon the Earth. Standing as it does for the approach of age in planetary existence, it may be likened to the first gray hairs in man. Or better still, it corresponds to early autumnal frost in the passage of the seasons. For the beginning to age in a planet means not decrepitude in its inhabitants, but the very maturing of this its fruit. Evolution of mind in its denizens continues long after desolation in their habitat is set in. Indeed, advance in brain power seriously develops only when material conditions cease to be bodily propitious and the loss of corporeal facilities renders its acquisition necessary to life. The resemblance, distant but distinctive, of the climatic conditions necessary on Earth for the best scanning of Mars, with those which prove to be actually existent on that other world, has a bearing on the subject worth considerable attention. It helps directly to an understanding and interpretation of the Martian state of things. Though partial only, the features and traits of our arid zones are sufficiently like what prevails on Mars to make them, in some sort, exponent of physical conditions and action there. Much that is hard of appreciation in a low, humid land shows itself an everyday possibility in a high and dry one. The terrible necessity of water to all forms of life, animal or vegetal, so that in the simple thought of the Aborigines, rain is the only god worth great propitiation, upon the due observance of which everything depends, brings to one a deeper realization of what is really vital, and what but accessory at best. One begins to conceive what must be the controlling principle of a world where water is only with difficulty to be had, and rain unknown. 
But in addition to the fundamental importance of water, the relative irrelevancy of some other conditions, usually deemed indispensable to organic existence, there find illustration too. On the high plateau of northern Arizona, and on the still higher volcanic cones that rise from them as a base into now disintegrating peaks, the thin, cold air proves no bar to life. To the fauna there, air is a very secondary consideration to water, and because the latter is scarce in the lowlands and more abundant higher up, animals ascend after it, making their home at unusual elevations with no discomfort to themselves. Deer range to heights where the barometric pressure is but three-fifths that of their generic habitat. Bear do the like, the brown bear of northern American sea level being here met with two miles above it. Nor is either animal a depauperate form. Man himself contrives to live in comfort and propagate his kind where at first he finds it hard to breathe. Nor are these valiant exceptions, as Merriam has ably shown in his account of the San Francisco Peak region for the Smithsonian Institution. A most interesting report, by the way. The other animals are equally adaptive to the zones of more northern latitudes on the American continent. Zones paralleled in their flora and fauna by the zones of altitude up this peak. All which shows that paucity of air is nothing like the barrier to life we ordinarily suppose, and is not for an instant to be compared with dearth of water. If in a comparatively short time an animal or plant accustomed to 30 inches of barometric pressure, can contrive to subsist sensibly unchanged at 18, it would be rash to set limits to what time may not do. And this the more for another instructive fact discovered in this region by Merriam, that the existence of a species was determined not by the mean temperature of its habitat, but by the maximum temperature during the time of procreation. A short warm season in summer alone decides whether the species shall survive and flourish. That it has afterward to hibernate for six months at a time does not in the least negative the result. That the point of departure should thus prove of twofold importance speeding the observer on his journey, and furnishing him with a vade mecum on arrival, is as curious as opportune. Without such furtherance to the bodily eye on the one hand and the mind's eye on the other, the voyage were less conclusive in advent and less satisfactory in a tent. Chapter 3 A Bird's-Eye View of Past Martian Discovery With Mars, discovery has, from the start, waited on a parent disk. To this end, every optical advance has contributed, from the time of Galileo's opera glass to the present day, for apparent distance stands determined by the size of the eye. But although it is the telescopic eye that has increased, not the distance that has diminished, the effect has been kin to being carried nearer the planet, and so to a scanning of its disk with constantly increasing particularity. Mankind has to all intents and purposes been journeying Marsward through the years. Any historic account of the planet, therefore, becomes a chronicle of seeming bodily approach. Perhaps no vivider way of making this evident, and at the same time no better preface to the present work could be devised, 
than by putting before the eye in orderly succession the maps made of Mars by the leading areographers of their day. Since the planet first began to be charted 65 years ago, the procedure is as much as possible like standing at the telescope and seeing the phenomena steadily disclose. Seen thus in order, the facts speak for themselves. They show that from first to last, no doubt concerning what was seen existed in the minds of those competent to judge by systematic study of the planet at first hand, and furthermore, from their mutual corroboration that this confidence was well placed. For far from there being any conflict of authorities in the case, those entitled to an opinion in the matter prove singularly as one. Beginning with Medler in 1840, the gallery of such portraitures of the planet comprises those by Kaiser, Green, and Scaparelli, continued since Scaparelli's time by the earlier ones of the present writer. To this list has been added one by Flammarion, which, though not solely from his own work, gives so just a representation of what was known at the date, 1876, as to merit inclusion. The remarkable drawings of Dawes and the excellent ones of Lockyer in 1862 to 1864 were never combined into maps by the observers, and though the formers were so synthesized by Proctor in 1867, the result was conformed to what Proctor thought ought to be, and so is not really a transcript of the drawings themselves. Each of the maps presented marked in its day the point areography had reached, and each tells its own story better than any amount of text. They are all made upon Mercator's projection, and omit in consequence the circumpolar regions. The latter ones give, too, only so much of the surface as was shown at the opposition they record. For Mars, being tipped now one way, now another, regards the Earth differently according to its orbital position. In comparing them, therefore, the equator must be taken for medial line. Mercator's projection has been the customary one for portraying Mars, except for such oppositions as chiefly disclose the Arctic Pole, and this, too, with a certain poetic fitness for it comes by right of priority to delineation of a new world, seeing that Mercator was the first to represent in a map the mundane new world in its entirety by the rather important addition of North America to the southern continent already known. In looking at the maps, it is to be remembered that they are what we should call upside down, south standing at the top and north at the bottom. Inverted they show because this is the way the telescopic observer always sees the planet. The disk would seem unnatural to astronomers were it duly righted. Just the same do men in the southern hemisphere look at our own Earth topsy-turvy according to our view the sun being to the north of them, and the cold to the south. Certain landmarks distinguishable in all the maps may serve for specific introduction. The V-shaped marking on the equator pointing to the north is the Sirtis Major, the first marking ever made out upon the planet, and drawn by the great Huygens in 1659. The isolated oval patch in latitude 26 degrees south is the Solus Lacus, 
the pupil of the eye of Mars, while the forked bay on the equator, discovered by Dawes, is the Sabius sinus, the dividing tongue of which, the Fastigium aran, has been taken for the origin of longitudes on Mars. Twelve maps go to make the series. They are as follows. Map 1. The map of Beer and Medler, made in 1840. 2. The map of Kaiser, made in 1864. 3. The map of Flammarion, 1876. 4. The map of Green, 1877. 5. The first map of Schiaparelli, 1877. 6. The second map of Schiaparelli, 1879. 7. The third map of Schiaparelli, 1881. 8. The fourth map of Schiaparelli, 1884. 9. The first map of Lowell, 1894. 10. The second map of Lowell, 1896. 11. The third map of Lowell, 1901. And 12. The fourth map of Lowell, 1905. If these maps be carefully compared, they will be found quite remarkably confirmatory each of its predecessor. To no one will their interresemblance seem more salient than to draftsmen themselves. For none know better how surprisingly, even when two men have the same thing under their very noses to copy, their two versions will differ. Judgment of position and of relative size is one cause of variation, focusing of the attention on different details another. What slight discrepancies affect the maps are traceable to these two human imperfections. Maps 4 and 5 make a case in point. It was to his newfound canals that Scaparelli gave heed to the neglect of a due toning of his map, while Green, less keen-eyed but more artistic, missed the delicate canaliform detail to make a speaking portraiture of the whole. Amid the remarkable continuity of progression here shown, in which each map will be seen to be at once a review and an advance, we may nevertheless distinguish three stages in the perception of the phenomena. Thus we may mark 1. A period of recognition of larger markings only, 1840 to 1877. 2. A period of detection of canals intersecting the bright regions or lands, 1877 to 1892 and three, a period of detection of canals traversing the seas and of oases scattered over the surface, 1892 to 1905. Each period is here represented by four charts, and each expresses the result of a more minute and intimate acquaintance with the disk than was possible to the one that went before. To realize, however, how accurate each was according to his lights, it is only necessary to have the seeing grow steadily better some evening, as one observes. He will find himself recapitulating in his own person the course taken by discovery for all those who went before, and in the lapse of an hour, live through the observational experience of sixty years, in much the same way that the embryological growth of an individual repeats the development historically of the race. Two verses of Ovid, 
which the poet puts into the mouth of Pythagoras, outline with something like prophetic utterance the special discoveries which mark the three periods apart. Where once was solid ground, I've seen a strait, lands I've seen made from out the sea. True as the verses are of earth, the poet could not have penned them otherwise had he meant to record the course of astronomic detection on Mars, for they sound like a presentiment of the facts. A surface thought at first to be part land, part water, the land next seen to be seamed with straits, and lastly the sea made out to be land. Such is the history of the subject. Ovid's words ring like Scaparelli's own announcement of the discovery of the canals. Indeed, I venture to believe he would have made it had he chanced to recall the verse. So vidi factus ex aquiore terras tells what has since been learned of the character of the seas. Of the three periods, the first was that of the main or fundamental markings only. It came in with Beer and Medler, the inaugurators of areography. That they planned and executed their survey with but a four-inch glass shows that there is always room for genius at the top of any profession and that instruments are not for everything in its instrumentality. Up to their day, the reality of the planet's features had been questioned by some people, in spite of having been certainly seen and drawn by Huygens and others. Beer and Medler's labors proved them permanent facts beyond the possibility of dispute. The second period was the period of the discovery of the now famous canals, a new era in the study of Mars opened by Schiaparelli in 1877. Unsuspicious of what he was to stumble upon, he seized the then favorable opposition to make, as he put it, a geodetic survey of the planet's surface. He hoped this undertaking feasible to the accuracy of micrometric measurement. His hopes did not belie him. He found that it was possible to measure his positions with sufficient exactness to make a skeleton map on which to embody the markings in detail, and thus to give his map vertebrate support but in the course of his work he became aware of hitherto unrecognized ligaments connecting the seas with one another. Instead of displaying a broad unity of face, the bright areas appeared to be but groundwork for streaks. The streaks traversed them in all directions, tessellating the continents into a tilework of islands. Such mosaic was not only new, but the fashion of the thing was of a new order of kind. Straits, however, Scaparelli considered them, and gave them the name canali, or channels. How unfamiliar and seemingly impossible the new detail was, is best evidenced by the prompt and unanimous disbelief with which it was met. Unmoved by the universal skepticism which rewarded what was to prove an epic-making discovery, Scaparelli went on, in the judgment of his critics, from bad to worse. For in 1879, he took up again his scrutiny of the planet, to the detecting of yet more particularity. He reobserved most of his old canals, and discovered half as many more, and as his map shows, he perceived an increased regularity in his lines. In 1881 to 1882, he attacked the planet again, 
and with results yet further out of the common. His lines were still there, with more beside. If they had looked strange before, they now appeared positively unnatural. Not content with a regularity which seemed to the skeptics to preclude their being facts, he must needs see them now in duplicate. To the eyes of disbelief, this was the crowning stroke of factitiousness. In consequence, no end of adverse criticism was heaped upon his observations by those who could not see. But curiously enough, what did not attract attention, the blindness of the critics was as much mental as bodily, for they failed to perceive that the very unnaturalness which seemed to them to discredit his observations really proved their genuineness. His discoveries were so amazing that any change in strangeness simply went to confirm the universal skepticism and clouded logic. Yet properly viewed, a pregnant deduction stands forth quite clearly on a study of the maps. And that seems as good a place as any to end this evening's reading From Mars and Its Canals by Percival Lowell. I've never read this book before, and I confess I find it very intriguing. I can't wait to hear the arguments he makes about Mars. We'll definitely be coming back to this one. If you'd like to read this work for yourself and see the maps he's referencing, as always, you'll find a link to a free ebook from Project Gutenberg in the show description. If you'd like to connect or suggest a boring book you'd like to hear read, the best place to catch me is on Twitter at Boring Books Pod or send me an email via our website, www.boringbookspod.com. I always love hearing from you. Thank you so much for joining me for this evening's reading. Until our next boring book, good night.